Now we're starting a new series here in chapel today. Uh, we are a blank community. Now I think you'll see a picture on the screen since our earliest days. That has been one of Ozark's mottos. That's a picture of an old sign. I don't know how old that is, but I can tell you for 80 years, we have unapologetically been a Bible college where the word of Christ is taught in the spirit of Christ. In fact, I want you to think of it this way. Think of our curriculum as kind of one of those um, divided plates with three sections for your food. And over here in this section is general studies, math, science, English, history, composition. We want you to be a well-educated person, so that section is general studies. And over here in this section, that's practical studies, where we prepare you in classes practically, uh, vocationally, for preaching and children's ministry, worship ministry, organizational leadership, whatever. That's practical studies. But over here in this last section of the plate is biblical studies. And what you quickly notice is that's the biggest section on the plate. Here at Ozark, we require 50 hours of Bible classes. It is the biggest helping of your educational meal here. Why? Because we are a biblical community. Like, we, we really believe our text for this morning, which is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. There Paul says this to Timothy. He says, from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. And how they are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God, that's you, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We want to equip you for God's work, so we're going to fill you with God's word. And here at Ozark, you are going to memorize lots of scripture. You're going to take classes that just make their way through Bible books. You're going to take classes on how to study the Bible and classes on how to preach and teach the Bible because we are a biblical community. But can I let you in on a little secret? Here at Ozark, we don't just study God's word. We don't just believe God's word. We don't just memorize God's word. We teach and preach God's word. Here at Ozark, we love God's word. Can I show you what this looks like? Picture number one, Francis Schaeffer was a well-known author, brilliant Christian apologist. And Francis Schaeffer said that he used to keep on the nightstand next to his table, or next to his bed, he kept his Bible right there on that little table. And Francis Schaeffer said that sometimes in the morning when he would wake up, he said, I know, I, I know this sounds melodramatic, he says, but sometimes when I wake up, I am so overwhelmed with gratitude for this book that I just reach over onto my night table and I just pat my Bible. I am so thankful for it. I just pat my Bible. That's a picture of love. Uh, picture number two. Bob Martin, my friend Bob Martin is an Ozark Christian College graduate, longtime preacher in a little town uh, here in Missouri. And Bob Martin, Bob Martin has so much scripture memorized that everybody who knows him, this is literally his nickname, they call him Bible Bob. In fact, Bob Martin loves God's word so much that one year during his devotional time for, for the course of one year, he wrote out the entire Bible longhand. He copied this entire book. Why? Because he just wanted to feel God's word coming out of his fingers. And as he wrote it, he would say the words out loud, just rolling those sentences around in his mouth like a piece of candy. That's a picture of love. Okay. Show you one last picture, picture number three, what this looks like. Penny. Penny is a girl that Donald Miller met when he was a campus minister at a college in the Pacific Northwest. Now, when Penny first went to college, she was not a Christian, didn't want to be a Christian, but she ended up with a Christian roommate named Nadine. And Nadine was nothing like she expected. Nadine was actually interesting, and she was intelligent, and she was gracious. And when Donald Miller met Penny, Penny had become a Christian because of Nadine's witness. And, and in fact, Penny one time told Donald Miller how this happened. Can I, can I read to you what, what he writes? He said this. Penny told me the story of how she became a Christian. She said, Nadine and I would sit for hours in our room, and, and mostly we would talk about boys or school, but always by the end of it, we would talk about God. One day she asked me if I wanted to read through the book of Matthew with her, and in fact, I did. I wanted to see if this whole Jesus thing was real. And Donald Miller asked her, he said, so, so that's when you started reading the Bible? Yes, she said. We would eat chocolates and smoke cigarettes and read the Bible, which is the only way to do it, if you ask me. She said, Don, Don, the Bible is so good with chocolate. 
I always thought the Bible was more of a salad thing, you know, but it's not. It's a chocolate thing. Now, all of our Christian college students hear me. Do not smoke cigarettes when you read the Bible. Do not smoke cigarettes at any time. But did, did you hear what Penny said? Penny thought that reading the Bible was kind of this have-to kind of thing, like eating salad, but she discovered that reading the Bible was a want-to kind of thing. It was a get-to kind of thing. It's like eating chocolate. That's, that's a picture of love. And here at Ozark this year, we don't want you to just read this book and study this book and preach and teach this book. I want you to love this book. We want you to hunger for God's Word like it is your favorite food. So can I do this? For the rest of the minutes that I have left here today, can I help you find that hunger? Can I help you kindle and spark that love for God's word? I think I think the secret to loving God's word is actually right there in our text, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's see if we can find it. Here we go. As I'm reading this text, I, I noticed this phrase, all scripture is useful for teaching. Now don't rush past that. Because there's actually a simple but powerful truth underneath that little phrase, and it's this. The Bible is a thing that can be taught. The Bible is a thing that can be learned. The Bible is a thing that can be understood. Could, could the secret to loving God's Word be as simple as that? Could we love the Bible for its clarity? The fact that it can be understood. That might be the reason we love God's Word, because I'm telling you, I love the fact that the Bible is understandable. The Bible's clarity is a very good thing. Now, now theologians call the doctrine of the Bible's clarity, they call it the perspicuity of Scripture. And that is super dumb. Because perspicuity is like literally the most unclear word you could use to talk about the clarity of the Bible. Right? Theologians are idiots. But what I'm telling you is that theologians are also brilliant because they are absolutely right to say that the perspicuity of Scripture is an essential doctrine. It is. And when we talk about the doctrine of the clarity of Scripture, we, we don't mean that every single thing in the Bible is easy to understand. It's not. There's hard stuff in there. The doctrine doesn't mean that we can understand the Bible perfectly, but it does mean that we can understand the Bible sufficiently. All the main things we need to know and believe and do can be clearly seen and understood. And this doctrine, this doctrine of the Bible's clarity is important because it tells us something important about God. It tells us God wants to be known. The Bible tells us from literally the very first page that God talks. You remember Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said 11 times in the first chapter, God speaks. Now, freshmen, some of you are like me. I'm an introvert. Some of you are introverts. And, and you like people, but sometimes you just need some alone time. You need some quiet time. But God, in his wisdom, gave you an extrovert for a roommate. <laughs> And at some point this semester, you're going to be in your room uh, some afternoon with your roommate, and she's just going to be talking and talking. And you're thinking, you've been back here for 30 minutes, and you've been talking for 40 of them. How is this possible? So much talking. And it will be a good discipline for you to learn to listen, enter into a relationship, because newsflash, God's a talker. Maybe he's an expert, I don't know, but I know this, he's not silent. God, God could have chosen to remain unknowable, inscrutable, unreachable. He could have been this celestial uh, hermit, this divine uh, introvert locked away in a corner somewhere beyond the universe, far beyond all human understanding, but he did not do that. The Bible is God's gracious choice to give up his privacy, to crack the door open on his life and invite you into relationship. God spoke to us in human language in complete sentences with subject and verb agreement. Right? He spoke to us in grammar that can be diagrammed and analyzed and understood. And the clarity of Scripture tells us that God wants to be known. In fact, in fact, it tells us that God wants to be known by regular people. Because God did not communicate in some kind of secret, esoteric language that only super smarty pants people can decipher. I know sometimes Bible college students like to think they're the only ones who really understand the Bible. I am a BGH student. I have studied the original languages. I know Hebrew. I know Greek. Yeah, big whoop de do. Guess what? Every five-year-old in Athens knows Greek. Woo-hoo! All right. 
the Bible is not just for scholars. Hello? In fact, in fact, when God spoke in Greek, that Jesus came to feed his sheep, not his, that Jesus came to feed his sheep, not his giraffes. That's right. And all scripture is useful for teaching, useful for teaching all people. God spoke in ordinary everyday language because he wants to be known by ordinary everyday people. And I'm telling you, that's why the Bible is a chocolate thing. That is so good. Maybe that's why we hunger for it. Maybe we love it just for its simple clarity. But maybe it's more than that. Can I go back to our text? Paul says this to Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed. He says, stay away from false teaching, Timothy. Stick with the scriptures because it's from God. Maybe, maybe that's why we love the Bible, because of its trustworthiness. It's from God. Maybe we love it because of its trustworthiness. Now, at the church that I attend, our family goes to here in Joplin, I am a children's church teacher. And uh, this was a few years ago. I was I was at Children's Church. I was teaching the kids. I was telling the kids the story of King Solomon. Telling the story about the two ladies that came before the king, arguing about whose baby it was. You remember this? And King Solomon says, cut the baby in two and give each woman half. Because, you know, that's a really good story to tell kids. And right there in the middle of the story, as I'm teaching away, Zach, five years old, on the front row, raises his hand. Yes, Zach. Mr. Matt, I would not want the butt half. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Zach, well, I had not actually thought about that, but uh, I, I, I guess I wouldn't want the butt half either. And what Zach was really telling me in this moment was this. He was right there in the middle of that Bible story. Like, he really believed this story. I mean, he was standing right there at the royal court. I mean, he was in those Bible sandals right next to those two ladies. And that Bible story was the realest thing that he had ever heard. Not a doubt in his head. Never questioned the historicity of that story. Only question in his mind was which half to choose. And when you, when you listen to Jesus in the Gospels, that's what you hear. That same kind of faith in Scripture. Because Jesus, like, really believed all those Old Testament stories. You read through his teaching. And he mentions, without blinking an eye, Abel, Noah, Abraham, Sodom and Gomorrah, Isaac, Jacob, man in the wilderness, the serpent in the wilderness, Moses is the lawgiver. He mentions David, Solomon, the queen of, uh, of Sheba, Elijah, Elisha, the widow of Zarephath, Damon, Zechariah, and Jonah. And Jesus never once questions a single event, never once questions a single miracle, never once questions a single historical claim on the pages of Scripture because Jesus knew this. All Scripture is God breathed. He knew better than anyone that there is no other book on the planet like this one. Every other book you know originated within our sphere of existence. This is the one and only book that actually originated from outside our sphere of existence. And yes, yes, it was written by men, it was written by humans, but they were carried along by the Spirit of God. These words come to you from the very throne room of heaven. And you, you can still catch the scent of God's breath on its page. And because this comes to us from the perfect mind of God, the God who knows all, the God in whom there is no falsehood, this book is never wrong. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 35, the scripture can never be broken. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, truly I tell you until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. This book is inviolable. It is inerrant infallible, unbreakable, and this book can be trusted because it has the delegated authority of God himself. It comes up against the teaching of our world, sometimes the teaching of our own hearts, our emotions and feelings and experiences trying to tell us something. Hear me, when the wisdom of Scripture comes up against the wisdom of the world, always let this text win. This book can be trusted, and in a world of fake news all around us in culture, and in a world of fake news sometimes from our own very hearts, this is the rock we stand on. Maybe, maybe that's why we love this book. Oh, that's a good thing. It is trustworthy. But maybe there's another reason. Can I look at our text again? Maybe we love the Bible for its helpfulness. Maybe that's it. 
Maybe we love the Bible because, yes, it's clear, that's good, yes, it's trustworthy, but, but is it actually useful to me? Is it beneficial? I mean, will it help me in any way? Is this a net positive in my life? And the answer is, yes, it will. Paul says in our text that all Scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Did you notice those four verbs? Teaching, that's telling you what's right. Rebuking, that's telling you what's not right. Correcting, that's telling you how to get right. And training, that's telling you how to stay right. And I'm telling you that the Bible will help you live right. It will help you live the life you've always wanted to live. Charles Spurgeon said this. Charles Spurgeon said the Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone whose life isn't falling apart. And maybe that's why we hunger for the Bible. When my wife, Katie, and I were dating, we discovered that the Bible can transform us. Over time, reading the Bible isn't... It's, a, it's actually not like drinking caffeine, that instant jolt to get you through the next few hours. Reading the Bible is more like taking in vitamins and, and eating lean beef and chicken and fruit and vegetable beef. It's taking in nourishment that will slowly strengthen you with greater health over the long haul. Because listen to me, as God's word gets into your marrow and into your bloodstream, it metabolizes into things like goodness and joy and courage and wisdom in your life that you have never had before. And when you pick up a Bible, you are not just holding 12 ounces of paper and ink and glue. You are holding the possibility of a whole new view. When Katie and I were dating in Bible college, we decided, as just kind of a help to keep us holy, we decided to memorize the New Testament book of Colossians together while we were dating. And so we started dating in January of 1990, and, and so for that first week of the semester, um, we memorized Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, first paragraph of Colossians chapter 1, all week long in our separate dorms, me and Willie, she and Goodman, we were working on our, on our, on our uh, uh, little memorizing for that paragraph, and then on Friday night, that was our date night, um, I went over to Katie's dorm, and before I took her out uh, to McDonald's, I... <laughs> We said our paragraph to each other. And then the second week of this semester, we memorized the second paragraph of Colossians chapter 1 and so on every week until by the end of the semester, we did it. We memorized the whole book of Colossians. We quoted all four chapters of that book to each other. Now, you know, you know how some couples have their song, you know what I'm talking about, and when their song comes on the radio, comes on their Spotify playlist, what do they do? They, they look at each other up and be a guy, you know. Uh, that's my song. I love you. It's gross. It's sick. It's just wrong. You know I'm right. <laughs> I'm telling you that Colossians was our book. We would be sitting in class here at the Bible College, right next to each other, and, and out front, a professor would quote from Colossians. I'd look over at Katie, all googly eyed. <laughs> That's our book. I love you. Bible College romance is weird. You just can't know that. <laughs> And Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You want to know why you memorize scripture? You memorize the Bible so that it's ready when the Holy Spirit needs it. Can I tell you what happened after I memorized Colossians? I would be in a moment, I remember this moment in class, where I was tempted to lie to a teacher about an assignment. But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit flashed up on the screen in my mind, Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off the old self with its practices and you've put on the new self. And I told the truth. And another moment when I was tempted, frustrated to say something harsh to Katie, but then the Holy Spirit flashed up into my brain, Colossians chapter 3, verse 19. Husbands, do not be harsh with your wives. And I held my tongue. And in another moment, when I'm talking with a non-Christian, and I see a moment, an opening in that conversation, put in a good word for Jesus, but to be honest, I'm a little bit scared, and yet the Holy Spirit slaps me in the head with this verse, Colossians chapter 4, verse 5. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And so I spoke up and said a good word for the Lord. And listen to me. Students, God wants to sculpt every one of us into the image of Christ. And God took his words in Colossians and like a hammer and chisel, he just began to slowly knock off the parts of my life that didn't look like Jesus. And I, I have got so far to go. But when I see those little bits of progress that God has made in my life, I rejoice and I am grateful. And I understand why my friend Joe Puentes 
One time he told me that in his Hispanic church, they have a saying, La Biblia ha sido muy buena con nosotros. The Bible has been very good to us. And that's why the Bible is a chocolate thing. Because it will help you live the life that you want to live. It will help you be more like Christ. But oh, listen to me, students, it's, it's time for me to just take this message home. I, I, I just need to lay my cards out here on the table. Let me just tell you straight up. This is why we love the Word of God. We hunger for God's Word like our favorite food. Because the Bible is about our favorite person. We hunger for Scripture because of the Bible's hero. It's all about Jesus. Can I, can I tell you what I brought with me right over here? Um, this was a few years ago. And uh, I, uh, uh, Katie and I were, were rummaging through this box from our attic of old college keepsakes. These were things from our time as students here at Ozark. And I'm digging through this box. And I pull out this big new envelope. What in the world is this? And I reach into the envelope. And, and this is what I pull out. It's this great big stack of love letters. <laughs> And one summer, Katie and I were dating. We were apart all summer long. And as soon as I, I pulled these letters out of the envelope, all those memories came flooding back to me. Because twice a week, she would write me these letters. And I would run to the mailbox. And I would tear open that envelope. And I would just devour every sentence of those words that she said to me. I would be reading and rereading. I would be imagining the voice of my beloved. You know, the, the letter would say, you know, dear Matt. But I could hear what she was thinking, my handsome, wonderful guy. And I knew. <laughs> And those letters were my lifeline to Katie. Now listen, I did not set out to memorize these letters, but back then I could have just about quoted them to you because I lingered over them so long, by the way. By the way, Katie reached into that um, same box of keeps section and she pulled out a mail envelope and, and she pulled out both of the letters that I wrote her that summer. I'm a slob. And here's my question, why, why did I read these letters so hungrily? because they were from someone that I loved, someone who loved me, and I wanted to know her. I wanted to know everything about her. I loved those letters because I loved Katie. Hear me, this book is a letter to you from someone that you love, from someone who loves you. This book is from Jesus, and it's all about Jesus. In 2 Timothy 3, these are the scriptures that are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. This is the Jesus book. He's the hero of the story. John 5, 39, Jesus says, these are the scriptures that testify about me. The whole purpose of the written word is to show us the living word. The Bible was given to us to reveal Christ. And we love this book because we love him. Can I close this morning by doing this? Can I tell you about the best sermon I never heard? If I could time travel just once, if I could go back to any moment in history, I would go back to Luke chapter 24. Very first Easter Sunday, sun sinking low in the west, and right after Jesus is walking along the Emmaus Road, talking to two travelers who don't know it's him. And while they read their Bibles, they have never understood their Bibles, what it's, who it's all about. So Luke chapter 24, verse 27 says, The beginning with Moses and all the prophets, now that's a Hebrew way of saying Jesus started in Genesis and went all the way to the end to Malachi. It says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Can you, can you imagine this chapel service? Who's the preacher today? Jesus. What's his text? The whole Bible. What's his topic? Himself. This has got to be the best sermon ever preached. I wish I could have been there. But even though this is the best sermon I never heard, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, that Jesus could have said something like this. In the book of Genesis, I am there. I am the word of God creating the heavens and the earth. In the book of Exodus, I am there. I am the Passover lamb whose blood is sprinkled on the doorpost to save you from death. In the book of Leviticus, I am there. I am your great high priest. In Numbers, in Numbers, I am there. Your ever-present guide, a pillar of fire by day, a pillar of fire by night. I am the one lifted high in the wilderness, saving all who look on me from the serpent's poison. And I am that rock in the wilderness, broken from whom living water flows. Deuteronomy, I am the coming prophet, greater than Moses. I am the city of refuge to which the guilty may run. In Joshua, 
I am the commander of the angel armies. I am the captain of the Lord's hosts. In Judges, I am Eman's dagger. I am Shamgar's ox goat. I am Samson's jawbone. I am Gideon's sword. I am Israel's true deliverer from all of her enemies. In Ruth, I am the kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, I am the coming son of David. In First and Second Kings, I am the one greater than King Solomon. In First and Second Chronicles, I am the Shekinah glory of God filling the temple. In Ezra and Nehemiah, I am the rebuilder of all things broken. And in Esther, I am the unseen protector of my people. In Job, I am the redeemer of the pits. I am the only true comfort in times of trouble. In Psalms, I am the good shepherd. Nation. Lie down in green pastures and lead you beside quiet waters. In Proverbs, I am the wisdom of God. And in Ecclesiastes, I am the end of the matter, the true meaning of life. In Song of Solomon, and yes, I am in the Song of Solomon. In the Song of Solomon, I am the Rose of Sharon. I am the fairest of 10,000, the glorious bridegroom, coming to take my beautiful bride home. In Isaiah, I am wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and I am the suffering servant who was pierced for your transgressions, crushed for your iniquities. It was by my wounds that you were healed. In Jeremiah, I am the potter, patiently molding that stubborn clay and lamentations in the midst of your tears. I give you mercies new every morning because he healed them. I am that wind blowing from the four corners of the earth into the valley of the dry bones, resurrecting them to new life. And in the book of Daniel, I, I am the fourth man in the furnace. That was me. And by the way, by the way, Daniel was not in the lion's den. The lions were in my den. I was there. In Hosea, when my wayward life breaks my heart again and again, I am the faithful husband who welcomes you home in Joel. I am the one who restores the years of the locusts of Eden. In Amos, I am the burden bearer. In Obadiah, I am the judge. In Jonah, I am the true missionary pursuing the nations. In Micah, I am that ruler born in little Bethlehem. In Nahum, I am the avenger of God's people. Habakkuk, your strength. Zephaniah, your great reformer. Haggai, your cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, I am the son who is pierced. And in Malachi, I am the son of righteousness, rising with healing in my wings. Before Abraham was, I am. These are the scriptures that testify about me. And Jesus could step off that advance road and step onto the stage today. He could say this in Matthew. I am the promised king. In Mark, I am that powerful servant who heals the sick, feeds the hungry, conquers the demons, and raises the dead. In Luke, I am the son of man, full of compassion, who eats with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes and prodigals in John. I am the word made flesh. I am the mind, the bread of life, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world in Acts. In Acts, I'm the one that saw there on that Damascus road. I'm the one that turned the church's greatest persecutor into the church's greatest preacher. And in the book of Acts, I am the risen Lord. And when I am proclaimed among the nations, lives are transformed. The world is transformed. In Romans, I am for justification. In 1 Corinthians, I am for sanctification. In 2 Corinthians, I am for reconciliation. Galatians, I am for liberation. In Ephesians, I am for unification. Hear me in Philippians. I am one being in very nature, God did not consider a call to God something to be held on to, but I emptied myself and became nothing, taking the very nature of the servant. But in Colossians, I am the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, and firstborn from among the dead, so that in all things I might have the supremacy. In first and second Thessalonians, I am the coming king. In first Timothy, I am the one mediator between God and man. In second Timothy, I, I am the one who destroyed death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. In Titus, I am the God who does not lie. In Philemon, I am the one that turns slaves and masters into brothers. In Hebrews, I am the author and perfecter of your faith. To say yesterday, today, and forever in James. Oh, oh my dear heart, heaven, brother James. In James, I am that glorious power that transforms your faith into deeds. In 1 Peter, I am the chief shepherd. In 2 Peter, I am the patient Lord who wants none to perish. In 1 and 2 and 3 John, I am the word of life. In Jude, I am the one who is able to keep you from falling. And in Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega. 
I am the root of David. I am the faithful witness, the bride of the morning star. I am the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I am the lamb of the slain before the foundation of the world. I am Revelation's righteous warrior, returning to you on a white war horse. My eyes are like blazing fire. On my head are many crowns. I am dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And out of my mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. I will rule them with an iron scepter. And on my robe and on my thigh, I have this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh, Lord.